Hey, welcome to Gold Scratch. So, have you ever wondered why cam manufacturers grind camshafts four degrees advance? And what does that even mean? How do you tell if your camshafts four degrees advance? Uh, what about why they most street cams and certainly all pump street cams have 110 degree LSA, even though it's not the exact best LSA for performance and power? Uh, why do camshafts have bigger, typically bigger, longer durations and bigger lifts on the exhaust and the intake side? What is LSA? And how, what effect does LSA have on overlap? And what, how important is overlap? So today, if you stick with me for a few minutes, I'm going to try and answer all those questions and a whole bunch more. Uh, they were just kind of teasers. I created some I created some visual aids and I also found some visual aids that somebody else created. I'm going to use them to try and show you. I got uh, two or three pages of them here to show the effect of LSA. And so I'm going to try and get uh, through all that. We will have an update of what's going on in the shop. This is Thursday. Tomorrow we have another Todd Brown's bringing another Pontiac 389 engine. These other ones are 400, so that'll be three of them in here at once. Actually, four. And we'll tell you all the rest of the stuff that's going on at the end. But let's talk about the reason why you clicked on this video is to learn about camshafts. So hopefully I can provide some information. So depending on the level you're coming from, you may know more than I do already, or you may not, you may be at the learning stage. Take time to figure it out so you understand it either way. If you understand it, you don't need to memorize it. So as you go through this video, I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff we're going to keep going mike's going to put up a number of screenshots which of the stuff i'm showing you and other things that we hope you will find helpful and uh so use them stop this video and you know check out the screenshots uh, to make sure you understand it so i'm going to start by looking at uh camshafts i made uh, two other videos last fall camshafts 101 and 102 where i talked about kind of the mechanics of camshafts. And I'm gonna to touch back a little bit on that in this video, but I wanna keep moving right now. Uh, so this is kind of more theoretical and this uh, visual aid is a good demo on understanding how your engine sees your camshaft and how your camshaft sees your engine. There's a mechanical part and then there's a process part because uh, every engine is a process where you're taking chemical energy, turning it into heat energy, turning that heat energy, energy into mechanical energy, and that takes the four strokes of an engine. So we're going to start with this visual aid, and I hope you find it helpful. I thought it was really useful. So as you can see, there's four strokes every Four two stroke four stroke engine has four strokes for every uh, power stroke, and uh, this is an example. So there's the intake stroke is in green, uh, the compression stroke is in orange, the power stroke is in red, and the exhaust stroke is in blue. So let's start at the compression stroke or the intake stroke. Sorry. So the intake stroke basically starts when the intake valve opens, and there's the top dead center. So the green part is the time the intake valve was open, and that's a critical time. I'm going to use the other visual aid in a minute that I made, and we're going to use a, a comp cams 276HR for an example. But so in the comp cams number, that point in the graph is 32 degrees before top dead center. So even though the piss is still going up and it's on the exhaust stroke, the intake valve starts to open. It stays open all the way through the 180 degrees in the intake cycle and stays open past bottom dead center, depending on your camshaft for a performance street cam, usually 60 or 70 degrees after bottom dead center. So <clears throat> that's when compression starts. So compression is the orange part. So as you can see, the compression cycle when the com gas is actually being compressed is actually the shortest cycle of all. And I'm gonna get back, come back and explain the importance of this on the other graph but so you're continuing to compress until you get the top dead center and uh even though you have uh, combustion 
you're not making power, then power starts, the red starts at the bottom. So even though the spark plug fires somewhere around 34 degrees before top dead center, the piston is still coming up. So you're not making power. That power is actually trying to hold the piston go the other way. About 15 degrees after top dead center, you have maximum pressure in the cylinder. It pushes in the power stroke, pushes the piston down. That depression, that compression decays very, very quickly because the piston's going down, so it's making the cylinder have more volume, and therefore the pressure is going to drop quickly. Okay, and then about in the case of this cam, about 75 degrees before bottom bed center, the exhaust valve starts to open. Okay, and so you're not making any more power uh, on that stroke once the exhaust valve's open because all that. Uh, Heat and energy is going out the header or the exhaust pipe. So the exhaust valve is opening. It continues to open. As you can see, it's the longest part of the cycle, uh, the exhaust cycle. Past top dead center. So at top dead center, the intake valve is open here. The exhaust valve hasn't closed yet. That's your overlap cycle. So uh, that's one way to look at it. We're going to show you another uh, of the four cycles. I found that one a really... You can kind of get yourself inside the combustion chamber and feel it when you watch this. So let's back up and look at the other uh, visual aid. And uh, we picked the COMP 276HR cam, uh, which is pretty popular hydraulic roller camshaft. And I've used a couple of these. That's a big block cam. Uh, this one is, but the same grind is used on small blocks as well. So we're going to explain what all that means. and and use this as an example to describe the important uh, data that you look at when you find, when you look at your uh, cam card, we're gonna put a screenshot of the cam card. And if you buy cam, you get a cam card, it'll give you all these numbers and they're not much useful use to you unless you know what they mean. So we're gonna start by doing that. So start off describing, two seven, uh, comp calls it a XR276HR. The XR is uh, comp marketing, basically, but they do have various categories of camshafts for street performance, racing, high performance, etc. It's all in their catalog. You can check that out. But the important point is the next number is 276, and the 276 is the duration of the intake valve. So the first number in any cam uh, description will be the duration of the intake valve. And that's the duration, it's called the advertised duration or the duration at six thousandths. And the only reason it's six thousandths, a little bit of clearance is left there to take up flex in the valve train uh, from when the lifter comes off the base circle till the valve actually moves. So the HR is pretty simple, hydraulic roller. So uh, there are other numbers as well, but for purposes of this description, so using referencing back to where we were, it's the same logic this displayed in a different way. And we're also going to talk about uh, lobe centers, lobe separation angles, and how that's determined, camshaft being advanced, etc. So let's get this one out of the way first. So go back to when the intake valve uh, starts to open. In the case of the comp cam, uh, on, based on the, uh, on the advertised duration, uh, it's at 32 degrees before top dead center. So the intake valve in this case is green. So it's opening and the exhaust valve is still closing. So that's when your overlap occurs. So your overlap, if the intake opens 32 degrees before, the exhaust valve closes 27 degrees after, add your 32 and 27 and that's 59 degrees, that's overlap. I'm gonna talk about the importance of overlap. Let's continue on. The intake stroke is on the downstroke now where we're drawing fuel and air mixture into the engine. And that is the center line of the intake valve right there. So that center line is at 106 degrees after top dead center. Okay, 106 degrees from here to here. I think that says after bottom, but it should be after top dead center. So I just noticed that error. So that number is very important because if you degree a camshaft, uh, that's the most important number on the cam card. And you determine that the center line, if you determine that the center line of the intake valve, and I just made a video about the green cam, and that's exactly what we did, uh, is at 106 degrees after top dead center, then you got your cam in the right place, and every other dimension 
uh, should fall into place unless there's an error in grinding the camshaft. So the intake valve still open all the way down and then goes past the bottom dead center and then it closes in the case of this cam I think it's 60 degrees after bottom dead center so why is that important that's a very very important uh, metric in cams because even though the piston is is uh, on the way up on the compression cycle the intake valve hasn't closed yet and so until it's closed you're not compressing anything. So what the intake valve late closing point does is, and remember camshafts don't open and close instantaneously. It takes time to get up the ramp, etc. So the intake valve final closing point, until that happens, nothing's being compressed. So by having a later intake valve closing point uh, after bottom dead center, you're allowing more compression to escape and that allows you to run a higher compression engine. Uh, and still not have too much cranking pressure. Typically, when I design an engine, I aim for, for a streetcar, about 180 PSI. And the final thing we use to determine that, we know the static compression. We know, we know uh, all the other factors we need to know uh, of the engine. And the final number that's important is where the intake valve closes. So, and just to give you an example, if you have a four inch stroke, and you've got the head off it and you're degreeing it if you rotate it till the intake valve closes and you measure how far the piston is down the hole and let's say it's a four inch stroke and if it's down the hole three inches then your dynamic compression is going to be about 75 percent of your static compression doesn't it work out exactly but it's very very close so that's one way of predicting uh whether you have uh what your compression pressure is going to be and some viewers on my channel, when I've talked about camshafts before, wrote in that they use a process building engines. They put a degree wheel on the engine, they crank it over and measure the compression pressure with a gauge. And they keep moving that, advancing or retarding the camshaft until they get the maximum cranking pressure. And that's when they stop. So that's how important that is. So, okay, now the intake valve is finally closed. Okay, so now we have compression going on. Okay, at some point the intake, the, uh, the charge fires and we're making power again. And on the way down, your exhaust valve at 75 degrees before bottom dead center starts to open. And you might think, boy, that's pretty early. You're wasting a lot of power. Well, once the piston is down the hole, 75 degrees or more than 75, that's 90, 90 115 Sorry, 105 degrees from from top dead center. The piston's going down, so it's making a bigger space, so the pressure's dropping dramatically. So by the time that valve opens, most of the pressure's bled off anyway. And what's left is used to help extract the burnt fuels out the tailpipe. So uh, those are some major numbers. So let's look at the duration numbers, for example. So the intake duration, if we start at 32 before top dead center, then 180 on the way down, and another 64 on the way back up, 32, 180, and 64, 276 in their intake duration. And the exhaust duration, this is the advertised duration or duration at 6 thou. So at exhaust valve open 75 degrees before the bottom, 180 going up, 27 here, and the total is 282 degrees. So that's uh, quickly the major numbers when you're degreeing a camshaft or if you understand a camshaft. One of the things you can see, we'll talk about it later, is a symptom with your intake valve closes before the exhaust valve, sorry, intake valve opens before the exhaust valve closes, your cam is advanced. And I'm gonna move that on to the next uh, part of the video. I, Tried to make a a, uh, a demo for you on this one as well to explain lobe separation angle. So every dimension uh, that you'll find on a cam card is related to crankshaft degrees, not camshaft degrees. And so remember, there's 720 degrees of camshaft, uh, sorry, crankshaft degrees, and every 360 degrees of camshaft. So think about it. The, the 
gear on your camshaft has got twice as many teeth and is twice as big as the gear on your crankshaft. So every time the crankshaft the camshaft goes around once, the crankshaft goes around twice. And because you have a horse stroke engine, it only makes power every second cycle. So keep that in mind when we're talking about this. So this is almost the same idea as before. That's lift. So that's 250 thou lift. That's 500 thou. Yeah, the actual curve is a little rounder. I'm not good at drawing uh, anything but straight lines. So it looks a little peakier than it probably should because you have duration in this direction. So the total duration of the cycle is 720 degrees. So 180 degrees on this side, 180 degrees on this side. So the TDC is the center line when top dead center, when the engine comes to piston comes to top dead center. So this camshaft is advanced four degrees. And so there's your four degrees. So basically if you advance the cam, you move the lobes, the center line stays fixed and the lobes move this way. So the camshaft events valve opens earlier, closes earlier. The intake valve, exhaust valve also does as well. So how do you know if your camshaft's advanced? Uh, because this graphic also shows uh, the lobe separation angle is 110 degrees. So if your lobe separation angle and your intake center line are in the same place, if they're both 110, then your camshaft would be symmetrical. The intake would be equal to the exhaust. In this case, the lobe separation angle is 110 degrees. But the lobe set the center line that I showed you, I better go back and reinforce that. The center line of the intake valve is at 106 degrees. So that tells you that this cam is advanced four degrees. The intake's opening four degrees earlier and closing four degrees earlier as well. Because lobe separation angle is the only number that is measured in camshaft degrees, not crankshaft degrees. So if you have 110 degrees camshaft degrees, that would be actually 220 uh, crankshaft degrees. So let's talk about that. So why would they advance a cam in the first place? What's the point of doing that? So uh, the idea of it is uh, for, in order for a street engine to run well, if guys are picking camshafts with fairly aggressive lobes, Advancing the cam four degrees because a couple of things. It gets that intake valve moving earlier. Making power is, biggest challenge of making power is getting air and fuel mixture past that intake valve. So the sooner you can get it in motion, the better, okay? And the next part is when you advance the cam four degrees, going back to what I already said, it closes the intake valve four degrees earlier. So it traps more compression. That's why they advance it. So, uh, and you can tell if it's advanced if you compare your lobe separation angle uh, to your intake center line. If they're the same, it's not advanced. If they're different, it's advanced by the amount that they're different. So, so starting with the intake, the intake starts to open here. I went back before, I think 32 degrees, uh, goes all the way up. There's the center line of the intake valve on the way back down and that's your total duration for, and if you add those numbers up based on the, what I just showed you, you'll get uh, 278, 276, 282, 276 here, 282 here. And your point at which they cross is four degrees to the left of the center line. So this little overlap cycle down here, and this is when the intake and exhaust are open at the same time. So if you relate that back to my previous chart, this is when the intake is already open and the exhaust hasn't closed. These two numbers here, that's the overlap at the same time, is a very, very important uh, metric of your camshaft. So uh, let's talk about that. So what is a good number for that? And one of the things is that uh, just like life, camshafts are a compromise. Everything that's good about overlap at high speed is bad about it at low speed. So at high speed, uh, when you have intake and exhaust valve open at the same time, the intake charge is coming down your plenum of your intake manifold, trying to get around your intake valve. 
somewhere between 200 and 300 miles an hour. It's got a lot of inertia, it's got mass, and it'll purge during the time the two valves are open. Purge intake mixture in during the overlap period, out the header, evacuate all the dirty exhaust gases, supercharge the cylinder, and that's how you make power. That works good at high speed. So at low speed, the intake charge has still got mass, still got inertia, but it hasn't got any velocity. So because it hasn't got any velocity, when the piston is, when you're in the overlap cycle and both valves are open, the intake mixture is getting mixed with your exhaust mixture. There's chaos going along in your intake manifold. And for that reason, if you have a lot of overlap, then you're going to have a uh, very poor idle and you're going to have poor vacuum at idle. And so what's good about overlap at high speed is bad at low speed. What makes the engine efficient at high speed is the same thing that makes it inefficient at low speed. So that's the importance of overlap. Now this number, 59 degrees, what's a good number? It depends on a lot of factors. Uh, and I mentioned before, you just can't do that unless you know, you know the weight of your car versus cubic inches, pounds per cubic inch of the car, uh, the size of the engine. There's a whole bunch of other factors that I'm still going to talk about. But first, a good street engine, this one at 59 degrees is kind of in the middle of that. It's not a real radical cam, so overlap up to maybe 70 at the most and down as far as 50 is probably not a bad range to be. But once again, all the other factors have to be taken into consideration. So uh, there's another factor which is really important. We talk about overlap. So what determines your overlap? Your overlap is a function of your total degrees of duration and your lobe separation angle. So basically, uh, your overlap is a formula that works out pretty close is equal to uh, your total duration minus, minus two times your lobe separation angle. So uh, therefore, lobe separation angles, uh, as, they get, as they get smaller, will give you more overlap because you're taking your duration minus two times your lobe separation angle. So if you have a smaller lobe separation angle, the same duration, you're going to have more overlap. So tighter lo lobe separation, if you go look at this graph, it's just kind of a rough, just to give you an idea of it. So the amount of overlap you can have is a function of a, a couple of things. And uh, is the range of RPM that you're gonna be operating at, the higher, don't forget, the, the more overlap you have, the more efficient your is at, engine is at high speed. And the bigger the engine that you have, uh, trying to be fed from the same cylinder head. Now here's a kind of a tricky point. Uh, there's actually a formula and David Visard developed this formula. I'm not gonna plagiarize it. If you want to find out what it is, you can buy his book. And if you don't know who this guy is, you should find out because he's a pretty smart guy and I'm one of his students and I've learned a lot from reading his books and, and, uh, and watching his videos. So. There's actually a formula that takes into consideration the size of the intake valve uh, and uh, the RPM the engine is going to be running and the cubic inch size of the engine. Because let's take, for example, this is a 427 cam. So let's assume we have a stock 427 head on it. And with the same block, you could make over 600 cubic inches. So the more cubic inches that engine has, if you're using the same head, you think about it, you got to fill a bigger chamber in the cylinder with the same valve. So it needs more time to do its work. So you need more overlap and overlap goes up and I haven't got it written here, but lobe separation angle will go down at the same time. The smaller your lobe separation angle is going to be the more overlap you're going to have. So that's a function and it's very, very popular for guys designing cams to use David's formula. Check that out if you're interested, and you'll find that uh, it's pretty helpful. I use it when I design my engine. So, so what have we talked so far? So why would, I think I mentioned already, why would cam manufacturers advance the cam four degrees? It kind of protects us from ourselves because even though you have a radical cam, it kind of offsets the effect of it. And therefore, the next question is, why typically do camshafts 
have more duration and more lift, or more lift on the exhaust side of the cam than the intake side. And one of them, there's two reasons, I think there is anyway. One of them is when you advance the intake valve, you advance the exhaust valve too, right? And that isn't necessarily good, but by having more duration on the exhaust side, it kind of compensates for that. And the other thing is uh, for camshafts that have, uh, they're going in street, they're going in street cars. Typically these are camshafts that are going in street cars. But what do street cars have? They have manifolds or they have headers, they have exhaust pipes, they have mufflers, they have tailpipes. So overall, most street cars don't have a very efficient exhaust system compared to an open header. And the extra overlap and the extra lift helps to uh, compensate for that. So what have I covered so far? Why do you advance the cam? How do you tell if you have low separation angle? Once again, I already mentioned that, I think. Uh, and why we have overlap. Let me just check my notes here because I can't remember everything sometimes. So uh, there actually is a formula for overlap uh, or for LSA. We talked about LSA. So determine your LSA. Now it's on the cam card anyway, but if you want to understand it, okay, and we'll put this up as well. It's the intake center line. I'm jumping back and forth, but I'm trying to show you what's going on. The center line of the intake valve, duration before top, this center, and the center line, so the exhaust valve center line's over here somewhere, okay? It's duration from top to that center, add it together, divide by two, and that's your overlap. So you can calculate it that way. Advanced ground in, why the cam's advanced, what overlap is, I think I've covered most of that stuff. So, um, I'm going to just show a simple uh, demo here. I, I, in the previous video, we talked about the mechanics of a cam. I'm not sure how well I did this on the exhibit. So you look at a, let's look at one at a time. So there's a flat tappet camshaft, first of all. And this is out of that Pontiac engine. There's a flat tappet lifter. So you can get an idea of the difference between rubbing friction. That's how the, as the camshaft turns. The rubbing friction that occurs between the valve and the lifter compared to the roller cam with a roller that actually spins and has little needle bearings in it, right? So you can look at the lobes, both those lobes, it's not hard to tell which one is going to lift the valve faster, hold it open longer, keep it open longer, and let it down quicker uh, than the other. Obviously, you can, this cam it may not be fair. This is a solid solid roller cam out of a big block so it's actually a pretty big cam but still the the lift on any roller cam is a lot more aggressive than any flat tappet cam so that's just kind of a visual let's close off by what's going on in gold scratch so we've already got three pontiac engines in my shop already and if that wasn't enough we've got another one coming tomorrow todd brown's bringing a 389 pontiac these are all 400s actually that one's a 455 these are all 400s and a 455. And the 389 was the original GTO, 1964-65. Todd's is a 65 GTO. Todd's coming from Michigan and he's restoring his 65 GTO. And so he's coming and we are gonna make a video of Todd bringing his engine here. And we're gonna make a video of the teardown of that 389. It's a troubled 389. It's in need of a rebuild. And we'll find out more about that tomorrow. Uh, this is Joe's uh, engine. We're meeting on a couple parts for it. Uh, Joe's got to get me. One of them is the dipstick, so you can't finalize the oil pan on it. I could have this engine running in a day if I had all the rest of the parts, which I'll have pretty soon. Merrick's is over in the corner. Uh, his camshaft is on the way to me, and almost the same thing. Once I get those parts, each of these engines is going to take about a day. And... Uh, to do and they're going to be out of here then we'll focus on Todd's what's coming is we're going to go back racing so my son is going to race again up in Sault Ste. Marie where I come from uh, Michigan modified where Sault Ste. Marie is on the tip of northern Michigan and pretty popular around there open wheel modifieds and guess who gets to build the motor for him so that'll be a subject of our discussion we have a, a dyno date of uh, June the 8th First race is June 29th, 
going to bring the car down here in June. We're going to dyno the engine, install it in the car, get it running, all that stuff. We may even do some testing at Delaware. Delaware Speedway is 15 minutes from here. Depending on all the logistics of it, we're going to try and do some testing. So that's what's going on there. So uh, watch for that tomorrow. We'll be doing tearing Todd's engine down. So tip of the day, avoid verbal instructions. So I just have an experience. It's all good so far because this is the way I do it. If you're getting an engine built and you're bringing a bunch of parts to a machine shop or you're getting a bunch of work done by somebody, whatever it is, do not rely on verbal instructions. Write everything down. Now, I'm not a big contractor or anything, but I just brought the block for Mike's engine to the machine shop yesterday. I wrote a work order describing the engine, the numbers on it, specific amount of work that has to be done, what tolerances, dimensions I expect. Etc. So when I pick that engine up, I'm pretty darn sure uh, that it's going to be what I want it to be. Because when you machine an engine, if you get it wrong, it doesn't matter who's right or wrong, right? You still got a mess on your hands. So write everything down. Don't rely on uh, word of mouth. Don't rely on verbal instructions. I always forget to say it. Thank you for watching Gold Scratch. Please like and subscribe. We're growing. We need to grow faster. We're working hard to make good videos, and we got a bunch of good ones coming up for you. So thanks again for watching.